dive into this brand new season we know it is spring it gives us this reality that life can't be stopped and God is the perfect picture of that he can never be stopped so let's give him the praise that he is due as we stand and sing to him
can stop our God. There is nothing. There is nothing. Come on. There's nothing that can stop our God. There's nothing that can stop our God. There's nothing that can stop our God. There is nothing.
go ahead and have a seat. We're so glad you've joined us to worship this amazing God who's with us in the thick and thin and the hard struggles and in the amazing mountaintops of life. He's our God, and we're grateful that you've chosen to worship him with us today. If you're online or in the room and you're a guest with us, we'd love to hear from you. We'd, we'd love to get to know you. We'd love to know how we can help you get on journey, wherever you are in that journey, to be a part of what God's called us to do, and that is to share his love with everybody with whom we come in contact. So if you will, take out your smart device, again, whether you're watching online or here in the room, and text FL Guest. FL guest to the number 833-571-3475. And we'll have an opportunity to get back with you very quickly and talk about all those things. Now, if you're here today as well and you're wondering about who is this Jesus and what is this church about and how can I get involved and what are some ways that I can grow? Or I just need somebody to pray with me. If you'll do that same number, but this time change it to FL Respond. FL Respond to 833-571-3475. We'd be honored, we'd be privileged to come alongside you and walk you through anything and everything that God is doing and wants to do in your life. So give us a shout out. We'd love to connect with you. Also, for everybody else in the room or for everybody, period, online as well, if you would uh, take that same smart device and go to our Facebook page and share the live stream today. No telling who's out there waiting to hear what God's doing in our hearts and lives today, what Bobby will, will say from his word. Um, and you might be used of God to connect them with him. So if you would just share the live stream, use the hashtag enduring proof as you share that. That'd be a, a great way to get on mission, if you will. Uh, one thing we'd like for you to know about, uh, this Wednesday night, we're going to have a block party for as many and as varied a, a group of people that we can get to come here today, or here that Wednesday night. And we'll have this block party for anybody and everybody in our community. And we'd love for each of us to be there to welcome them and to encourage them and let them know that we're here for them and that we love them. And so please come. There'll be some food and there'll be some music and there'll be lots of activities and it'll be here on the premises right out that way. Love for you to be a part of that and help us extend this love to the folks in our community. So we'll look forward to seeing you Wednesday night. Now, uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, a bunch of guys got together and had some moments uh, that were enriching and uh, filled with growth, but they were also moments that were filled with ridiculousness and uh, craziness. We had a cornhole tournament, and it was, well, take a look. To those that would say that I might have been a little bit too competitive, they definitely don't understand the hours of practice that I put in to prepare for this tournament and and uh, just how important it is to win it and to get that, that cornhole bag with Sharpie written on it that says first place. Some people might tell you that you could get good at this game overnight, but they're very wrong. It takes way less time than that. Some of the cornhole heroes that I look up to include uh, Dwight Harrison and, uh, and his, his historic run that he made in uh, 1976, undefeated season. I, uh, that's someone that I'd really try to model my game out. <laughs> A typical day in training for cornhole starts obviously with a nutritious breakfast, followed by stretching and weight training. Then, and then usually by the time the day's over, you've practiced cornhole for five or six minutes. 
to be good at cornhole, really, you just have to have the ability to um, move your arm in a straightforward motion, and you can you can really compete. There's absolutely no corn that I'm aware of. I I brought my boards, and one of the bags busted, and I was disappointed to find that there was there was no corn in my in the bags. There's no corn. I thought that's why they called it corn. See, that, that was disappointing to me, too. I think things like this are just really, really neat and really interesting for us to be, to have available to us because it really gives you an opportunity to get to know people that maybe you see just in passing on Sunday or maybe even in your Bible classes if you didn't have a prior connection that you felt comfortable with visiting with them and, and uh, you know it's kind of hard to stand next to a grown man and throw bean bags at a box with a hole in it without kind of getting to know him a little bit uh, and so I, I just think it's really cool to to be around different generations and different groups of people and, and uh, just with the chance to know people that you just wouldn't have otherwise. Hey, good morning, church. So excited for a good day today. Uh, we get to celebrate with baptism. And so I'm going to welcome Brady Bach uh, to come join me out here. Today, Brady's getting baptized, but today's also his birthday. So if y'all would, make Brady feel welcome as he makes his way into the baptistry. Come on out, Brady. All right, Brady, we are so excited for you and about this moment that we get to celebrate with you. And so, Brady, we've had conversations, but I'd like for you to share with the church the decision that you've already made and why you're here today. So do you believe Jesus is God's son? Yes. That he came, died on the cross, and rose again? Yes. And you have committed to follow him for the rest of your life? Yes. Well, it's based on your profession of faith that I baptize you as my brother in Christ. We are buried with Christ in baptism, raised to walk in newness of life. Brady, thank you. Way to go. Let me pray for us. Thank you. God, thank you so much for this morning. And we rejoice for what you have done in Brady's life, for the forgiveness that you offer, and for his willingness to, to accept that free gift. God, I thank you for Jesus and in making that possible. And Father, I pray for Brady as he moves in his life and his walk of faith going forward as well. God, strengthen him. God, encourage him. And Father, I pray that even through his being baptized this morning, God, we might all be encouraged as well. Father, we ask that you continue in that, do your work in us and through us. God, thank you. It's in your son's name I ask all these things. Amen. Would y'all stand and continue worshiping with us?
cross, my freedom, your stripes, my healing, all oh, praise, King Jesus, glory to God in heaven. Your blood still speaking, your love still reaching, all oh, praise, King Jesus, glory to, to God in heaven. heaven. Guys, be seated as you're being seated. Let's take our Bibles and open them once again to the book of James, chapter 1. We're picking up where we left off in this series, and we're just going to consider verse uh, 12 uh, this morning. Let it stand alone and speak to us and challenge to us. And as I said last week, and I'll, I'll refer to this often as we go, to, uh, as we go through the book of James, that to, to really, uh, if James is going to have any kind of formative effect upon us and and this is true of any teaching under which you sit uh, any sermon that you sit under you you have to allow the text uh, to to challenge you and to stretch you you have to embrace the tension uh, that the text oftentimes creates within us this tension between uh, the challenge of the text and the life that we are actually living and so are we going to allow the text to stretch us and we're going to find that James does this in in a way that that really no other book in scripture really does the perspective and the framework of James life his family's life as an impoverished people uh, in this messianic community it really stretches us and if we are going to grow and it's true in life uh, mentally, physically, spiritually, if you're going to grow, uh, you have to embrace discomfort. You have to be comfortable being uncomfortable. In fact, on a daily basis, you have to seek out what is it that makes me uncomfortable. If I'm going to grow physically, mentally, spiritually, I have to be uncomfortable. Uh, otherwise, we are just digressing in every facet of our lives. And so uh, I want us to keep that in mind as we're going through the book of James because it is, in fact, a very challenging uh, book, and we will find that to be nonetheless true this morning in our passage of Scripture here in verse 12. James Poling wrote a book some time ago entitled The Search for America's Faith. And in Poling's book, all of his research, all of the data that he compiled, it, it led him to characterize, or to categorize rather, the American people in a, uh, in, into what he calls almost Christian. Almost Christian. That for most, they will have confession, but there is no conviction. They will have profession, verbal profession, but there will be no practice. There will, be no, there will be a verbal acknowledgement of Christian principle and Christian truth, but no visible connection with a local body of, of faith. And in his data and what he has compiled, his research reveals what we have already known, that ours is a very syncretic kind of nation, a syncretic kind of, pe kind of people, a, a hodgepodge, if you will, of, of various thoughts and belief systems. And that even when it comes to the Christian faith, that even for those who confess and profess a faith in Christ Jesus, that for the most part, people have a cafeteria approach to their faith. 
That is, they cherry pick like a smorgasbord. They, they cherry pick from a buffet the items that they like while neglecting the other parts that aren't quite as tasteful. The parts that would conflict with the life that we have already chosen for ourselves. And so what James does is James really cuts through, and this, this, is a, this, this is a timely issue. Polling didn't discover something new that's just 21st century America alone. This, this, this is an indictment against humanity in all time. And so James already recognizes that, that tendency, but what James does in a very concise, in a very succinct manner, he makes a simple statement, three clauses here in verse 12 alone, three clauses that we're going to break down, but in one sentence, he simplifies our understanding, what is to be our understanding of the life of faith, the framework by which we, we live our faith and our commitment to Christ. He does it in a way that is non-negotiable. He does it in a way that, that is very clear. And so none of us are going to leave here today wondering what is the life of faith about. He makes it simple. And sometimes it takes that, especially in matters of faith. I remember reading years ago about a company that was starting a pension plan for their employees. And there was one particular employee, Sam, that was being especially difficult on not wanting to participate in the pension plan. Well, the, the organization, the company that was underwriting this pension plan required 100% participation of all employees or they wouldn't cover it. And so the other employees were pleading with Sam to sign the paperwork that's necessary to start this pension plan by which all of us will, will benefit. And this guy was just a naysayer. No, it'll never work. We'll never get a payback on that. I'm not going to be a part of that. He was just shooting it down at every, at every turn. Well, finally, as the deadline was approaching, this had been going on months and months, trying to get Sam to sign this paperwork, the president of the company called him in. He said, Sam, right here on my desk is the paperwork for our pension program for all employees. It requires 100% participation. You either sign it or you're fired. Sam reached over there, picked up the pen, signed it, and walked out, started to walk out. The president of the company said, hey, Sam, wait a minute. He said, I'm curious, for months and months, your co-workers, your managers have been pleading with you to sign this necessary documentation. And yet I come in, you come in here when I call you in and I tell you either sign it or you're fired, what, what's the difference? He said, uh, well, no one ever explained it as clearly as you did. <laughs> well, that's what James is doing. He is explaining clearly the life of faith. What is to be our understanding of what it is to be the people of God. And he begins with a promise. He says here in that first clause in verse 12, James chapter 1, bless or blessed is a man. It's a state of existence for the people of God. It's the, it's, it's in, you've seen it in the, in the Beatitudes, that listing of all the blessed statements and really, these blessed statements are, are found throughout the entirety of, of Scripture. In the New Testament, the word blessed is the word makarios. And so whenever you see these, these statements, these blessed statements like James has utilized here in, in chapter 1 and, and verse 12, it, it's what's referred to as, as a makarism. A makarism, makarios. It's a word that means fortunate, blessed, happy, fulfilled purpose in life it's a state of existence by which God by which God through his power enables his people to face life to experience life to live life in a way that is purposed in a way that is fulfilled regardless of the circumstances and we know the circumstances we know that James is writing from a perspective on life. He's a part of a messianic Jewish community that is characterized by abject poverty. That's, his, that's all he's known all of his life. We go back to the Magnificat, Mary's Magnificat, back in Luke chapter 2. You read especially the Beatitudes of Jesus, his brother. You see that there is this, this impoverished perspective on life. And those individuals like James, like Mary, like Jesus, who made up this Anawim community, these were a people who were impoverished, who had no leverage, no power whatsoever, and yet they were still committed and devoted to the kingdom of God. 
their abject poverty had no impact at all upon their faithfulness and the demands of faith. You see, for James, whenever he uses this word blessed, to really appreciate what James is writing about when he uses this word blessed is the man. For James, he connects that word blessed all the way back to verse 2. It's a, it's a word blessed that goes in connection with the word joy back in, in verse 2 where he says, consider it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you encounter various trials. And again in verse 9 when he talks about we as an impoverished people, that, that audience to whom he is writing, this Jewish messianic impoverished community of believers. When he tells them to glory or to boast in their, in their high position, that these as a lowly people, you're in a position of glory and boasting. And as we saw in the previous weeks, when he talks about this perspective of faith that allows me to have joy, that allows me to boast, even in my adversity, he's saying that for us as a people of God, that what separates us, that, that what marks us in, our, in the effectiveness of our witness as a people of God, that we see through, through eyes of faith, we see through our circumstances. And for these, it's circumstances that would never change in their lifetime. This is no Pollyanna story that things are going to get better. You just hang in there. They're not. Not for the Anna Ween. And so he was writing to a people for whom things are not going to get better. But James makes it clear that through this, you can have joy, you can boast because you have the confidence. You can see through these trials and you have the confidence of knowing that God is accomplishing something formative within you that could not be done otherwise. That it's these very circumstances that has availed you to the providential purposes of God, that God is doing something formative in your life that could not have otherwise been accomplished. And now, when he uses that, bless, that word blessed, it's connected also to joy, to boasting, and to glory. But the word blessed also has an eschatological, if you will, an eschatological view. Now, when I use that word es eschatological, eschatology is the study of last things. When you hear the word eschaton, that's last days. And so when James is using the word blessedness, he's taking it from just, from just a present tense perspective that, yes, I know in this that God is doing something formative in my life, but now he's offering this eschatological view as well, that knowing that in the end, I can look ahead to the end, that even though my circumstances may not change, I can look ahead to the providential purposes of God being accomplished, his justice being fulfilled, and my faith being vindicated. That something formative is being done through this. Now that promise that James is alluding to in our existence as a people who are blessed regardless of circumstances, this is something that shapes our worldview. This is something that gives us confidence in life regardless of our, of our circumstance. It's a promise that sustains us and keeps us pushing forward beyond the moment to what God has in store. In the book entitled Finish Strong, author Richard Capon tells the story of naval, one of his many stories, but in this one particular story he tells, he tells of naval aviator Harry Jenkins. Harry Jenkins was shot down, Captain Jenkins was shot down over North Vietnam, was in a Vietnamese prison camp for seven years. But he had a very unique perspective. And what kept him going, and what encouraged and inspired others, was a perspective regarding circumstances, everything that happened, everything that, that he experienced. Captain Jenkins identified it and called it a good sign. 
when he was dragged out of his cell and tortured, it's a good sign, he said. It's a good sign that I'm getting closer to not being tortured again. When American bombers were carpet bombing North Vietnam, when his prison camp was being shaken, he said it's a good sign that American forces are ramping up and that maybe the end is near. When another Christmas came and went, he said that's a good sign that I'm getting closer to being back with my family again. And so the promise of God, James would say, this promise of God that we are a blessed people. That you are a people for whom God has a plan and a purpose. That is a good sign for you. Even in the midst of your trials and circumstances. But as there always is, there's more to this story. And in the life of faith, it's not just about promises. Because what James says now is that with that promise, there is a premise. There is a premise that holds true if the promise is to be reality. Blessed is a man, here it is, blessed is a man who perseveres under trial. And so the blessed state of existence to which James has alluded already in that first clause that blessed state of existence is based upon a premise. That state of blessedness becomes a reality for me and for you only as I endure. Only as I persevere. Only as I, not, I do not allow myself to be shaken and, and to be diverted from the circumstances and the hardships and, and the trials of life. You say, well, Bobby, wait a minute. I thought salvation was unconditional. Oh, we've, we've maligned some words. Yes, the love of God is unconditional. The love of God is conditional for anyone and everyone. But for those who would be the people of God, there are conditions by, by which we live our lives. There's expectations of how we should live as the people of God. And yes, we know that, that Jesus is the fulfillment, as we saw in Romans. We know that Jesus is, is the fulfillment of all those promises of, of the Abrahamic covenant. That it was fulfilled in, in Christ Jesus. We are a covenant people, yes. We do not work for our salvation. It is the free gift. Of God, but for those that would be the people of God, there are expected conditions. It's as old as Scripture itself. It goes all the way back to Deuteronomy, the Deuteronomic Code, or if you will, the Code of Deuteronomy. I mean, it's it, 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 it's simply stated throughout Scripture: obey, and you are blessed. Seeking to be obedient, seeking to live obediently to the teachings and the precepts of, of God's word. Obey and you're blessed. Disobey, you're cursed. It's a cursed existence. It's an existence that is either cursed or, or it is an existence that is blessed. Yes, God the greater, that's the whole idea of covenant. This idea of what is called in theological studies, it's called a suzerainty covenant a suzerainty type of covenant is where the the greater vassal gives himself to the lesser vassal and in this case God the greater vassal has given himself to the lesser va vassal we the we humanity but with covenant there's also Torah there's laws there's principles there's things that guide us for we us who would be the people of God 
And listen, don't think I'm holding forth some kind of salvation by works here. Not at all, but, but a salvation that is real, a salvation that is biblical, that is one that, that has brought about a new birth, that has brought about a conversion, that has brought about a transformation. It is characterized by, by a life that pursues obedience and, and it will endure in that task. Right? Jesus himself said that, those, that it's those who endure to the end that shall be saved. It is those that have not been knocked off course by, by the trials and the seasons of, of life. And there are things that There are things that happen in life that would seek to knock you off the journey of walking by faith and not by sight. Look at COVID, what we've come through. Unprecedented for us in our lifetime to go through an event like COVID and what has been experienced in the Western church is those that were were marginal in their faith, marginal in attendance before COVID over those two years, disappeared altogether. Knocked off track because of the trials and the circumstances of life. You say, well, Bobby, I thought, I thought we, we believed in once saved, always saved. That's not what I'm talking about. We've taken a statement like that, once saved, always saved, and, and we, we, have, we have maligned a doctrine that, that, that was that was very good. We, there, there is a doctrine, that statement, once saved, always saved, that, that emerged from a very real and substantial biblical doctrine that is best referred to and understood as the perseverance of the saints. And the most telling hallmark characteristic of a true believer is that they endure to the end. It's not confession, it's not joining the church, it's enduring to the end. Jesus said those who endure to the end shall be saved. Not those who made some decision at vacation Bible school as a six-year-old. It has no impact upon their life whatsoever. And what we've done with that statement, once saved, always saved, is we have lowered the bar on our understanding of salvation. What it means is if you are really saved, you will be saved. You'll be saved forever. If you were really saved, now that, that depends upon how you're, you're defining being saved. Conversion, transformation, new birth, a new creation in Christ Jesus. Being saved is not confession. Being saved is not joining the church. Being saved is not being baptized. Those are things that Christians do. Doing those things doesn't make you a Christian. The perseverance of the saints. It is enduring and not being knocked off track by the trials and the circumstances of life. You know what perseverance really is? Perseverance is the hard work you do after you've done all the hard work that made you tired. That's what perseverance is. Perseverance is all the work you do after you're exhausted. From the work that you have already done. And again, hear me, I'm not holding forth a salvation by works. But a faith that is real, a faith that is genuine, is a faith that will work itself out. It is a faith that makes itself manifest in the life of the believer. In fact, as we'll see next chapter, in chapter 2 and verse 18, James will say, but someone may well say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without the works and I will show you my faith by my works. A salvation that is real is a faith that it works. It manifests itself. It's something that has been transformational. It's like being born again, Jesus would say in John chapter 3. And so what James is doing here in verse 12, he's not not breaking new ground. He's not breaking new ground. He is just continuing a theme that goes all the way back to the ancient scriptures, even in Deuteronomy, that there is a premise for the promises of God. That our lives will look different 
that we will seek. And, and it is our passion to live lives that reflect the teachings of his word. Some of you will remember back in 1992, Hurricane Andrew devastated southern Florida, the Bahamas. I think it did like uh, some staggering number, some $37 billion. Those were 1992 dollars, some $37 billion in damage. But if you ever saw the news reports, and you can pull it up now on YouTube, go back and look, the, the devastation is apocalyptic. Communities just leveled to the ground, rubble. But I'll never forget one story that one news team was doing there amongst all this devastation, this apocalyptic rubble pile. There was one house that stood on the beach. And they were interviewing the owner of that, of that condominium. And they asked him, what do you think happened? Why do you think that your house remains standing while everyone else's is level? He said, I really don't know. He said, all I did was build my house according to the Florida building codes. He said, when, when the building code said to use two by six trusses, I used two by six trusses. And from what we see, not everyone built to code. I was told by the state of Florida that if I would build my house according to the code, that your house will stand. And it did. That's the premise of Scripture. That if you build your house according to code, you build your life according to the principles and the precepts and the pursuit of God's will and God's purposes made known in his word. Listen, when the storm comes, your life will stand. Yours will be a blessed existence even in the devastation that is around you. And then here's the prize. Blessed is a man who perseveres under trial, for once he has been approved. And this is the testing out of our faith. The trials of life will test your faith to see if it is genuine or not. For once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. And James seemed to be holding out an incentive clause, kind of like professional athletes. You know, every professional athlete today has incentive clauses that are built into their, their contracts. It's, it's, it's standards of performance. If you reach, you reach this standard of performance, you, you'll get this lump sum. You, you reach this and, you, and you'll get this kind of bonus. It's interesting that even in the Word of God, we find this, we find this language of incentive. And don't think it shallow. Even our, even our Lord would look past uh, even our Lord, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, it was the anticipation of more, of what it was to come, what the eye could not see. It was the anticipation of what was out there before him that enabled him to endure the cross, even with joy, as his brother James would write. Paul certainly borrowed from this concept when encouraging the, the church at, at Corinth in describing the life of faith, he said in 1 Corinthians 9, verse 25, everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things, so they do it to obtain a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. That's the victor's crown to which, to which James is alluding. Oak, laurel leaves, something that uh, evergreen that represented eternal life. And so Paul is encouraging the church at Corinth, listen, you, you hang in there and you fight. You've got, you've got something worth living for. I mean, if an athlete is willing to make this kind of sacrifice to do, to do this much work, to put this many hours into this for something that is temporal in nature, for a crown, then how much more? We as the people of God should be willing to give and to sacrifice and to labor 
for our Lord. Knowing that our reward is something that is eternal in nature. Paul didn't just encourage others that way. It was also something that I think motivated him in his own life. This idea of a prize at the end. As he was sitting in a Roman prison facing the possibility of his own death, Paul would write to his young understudy. And he would say this to Timothy, for I'm already being poured out as a drink offering. And the time of my departure has come. He's talking about death. I've fought the good fight. I've finished the course. I've kept the faith. I've endured. I've persevered. Shipwrecks didn't knock me off course. Stoning, beatings didn't knock me off course in my faith journey. A thorn in the flesh that the Lord wouldn't remove. It's telling me His grace was sufficient. As disappointed as I might have been in that, in that answer, in that response, when I think I could have done so much more, you know what? I never got off course. I stayed faithful. I finished the course. I kept the faith. In the future, there is reserved for me the crown, the prize, the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. And what James is saying and what Paul was saying and what Paul lived out in his own life is that this approach and this endurance, if the promise is going to be the reality of your life, this blessed existence, it's going to be based upon this premise of enduring. And for that to happen, you, you cannot let your eyes be blinded by the temporal. By the present tense, it's a mindset of faith and perspective that sees into the eternal, that has no hope in this present world, and keeps its eyes fixed upon Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. It's a view of life in an existence and an existence that realizes there is more to come. What's happening to you now? I promise you there's more to come. What you're struggling with right now, I promise you there's more to come. You endure, you'll experience it. When Roman soldiers used to wander inside those tunnels that are part of, that are found on the rock of Gibraltar. Those Roman soldiers in that ancient day, believing that, that the world was flat, that the world ended just a few miles to the west, Roman soldiers would chisel inside those, those tunnels on those walls the Latin phrase, ne plus ultra, nothing more beyond. After those ancient days, subsequent travelers and tourists who also would walk through those tunnels, they would notice that, that Latin phrase and, and what they would do in response, knowing that the world was in fact round, they would chisel out that negative nay so that what remained was plus ultra, more beyond. That's the prize of which James writes. Regardless of your circumstances, there is more beyond. And so you and I, we leave here as messengers of hope, of witnesses of hope. We bear testimony by our reaction to the world that there is more beyond. 
and we conduct ourselves accordingly. Let's pray together. Father, how grateful we are for the promise of more beyond. But not just more beyond, Lord, but the fact that we can live a blessed existence even now. Even in our trials, even in our overwhelming circumstances. That we as your people can live in a state of blessedness. We can choose to live in a state of joy and glory. When we see our world through eyes of faith, the conviction and the belief that even in in these times, you are accomplishing something formative and substantive. Something in our lives that, that is fashioning us to be the kind of disciples and people you would have us to be. Father, we pray each one of us for this perspective and this mindset that our presence might be one of hope in a world that is filled with despair. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Will you join us as we pray in response to what we've just heard? Though he was 
give us the same heart. Give us the same heart. Give us the same heart. More like who you are. May we be a church that lives according to the example of our Lord all week long. We'll see you soon.